Hi, uh, my name is Kennehild the Library, uh, and I, damn Kennehild, um, and I am here today to teach you a little bit about hell. Hell here meaning the history of the English language. Uh, this is a presentation given with a little bit of thanks and a little bit of apologies to Professor Jerzy Rubach, who was my history of the English language professor um, when I was at university. And he walked in the first day of class and he said, welcome to hell. He was this great, uh, very hilarious man. Um, and yes, welcome to hell. And we all were like, uh, and then he had a, a nice giggle and we all sort of relaxed. So, oh hell, here we go. Who am I? So before I give you this information, before I start talking about things that I am very excited about, I figured I'd, I'd sort of establish my credibility a little bit. Uh, my name is Claire Knutson Latta. I'm a uh, in the modern world. I have a bachelor's degree in linguistics from the University of Iowa and a bachelor's degree in history from UAA. I've studied uh, a number of languages formally, including English, obviously, uh, French, German, Russian, Danish, Old English, um, Old Norse, Gothic, Biblical Hebrew, and Latin. Please note, I'm not actually fluent in all these languages. Uh, to make that claim would be uh, a lie. But I've got enough understanding of how their grammar works that I can usually translate from the language to English. Going the other way around is always a little bit trickier because you're trying to uh, express concepts that may not be, especially with ancient languages, they may not be accessible in that ancient language. It's very hard to say, for example, in Gothic, I turned off my computer because the Goths had no concept of uh, electronics, never mind computers. So turning something on and off was beyond their ken entirely. Um, so languages that I can kind of fake my way through reading, largely because I have a knowledge of their either antecedents or, or uh, not antecedents, antecedents or followers. Um, no. Anyway. Now I'm getting my Greek and Latin mixed up and I'm tired. Anyway, so not important. What's important is uh, I can kind of fake my way through Dutch, Norwegian, Swedish, Icelandic, and Spanish, um, and a little bit of Italian. Oddly, Italian kind of presents a major, like there's a hiccup in my head and I have, a, have more trouble with Italian than Spanish. Um, so in the SCA, who am I? I'm Dam Kennehild of the Library, uh, as formerly known as Kennehild Kunnesigestochter, uh, only it turns out that the number of people who can pronounce Kennehild Kunnesigestochter is like, three. Um, and so I figured I would ease things up a bit and uh, change my name recently to Canal the Library, uh, which also gives me the great joy of getting to be the library. Uh, and then Clarendon Norwood was my uh, first registered name. Um, I have my Pelican. I received my Pelican in 2011, uh, essentially for being a giant bureaucrat, and my Laurel in 2012 for my interest and enthusiasm and knowledge about languages and research, especially uh, early Germanic languages. Um, I'm also a giant word nerd, and I live here in the Principality of Awartha, which is in the Kingdom of the West. So we're going to start with some really dull stuff, and I am sorry for that, but that's the way it is, mostly to make sure that we're all kind of speaking the same, using the same vocabulary, speaking the same language, as it were. Um, and it's it's useful to have this shared vocabulary, because as we get into the fun stuff, it's, it's good to be able to use the word without having to kind of go back and redefine it every time. So if you're an English major, most of this just skip right over. Uh, if you're not an English major and you have sort of a horrible memory of English in high school, I am really sorry for the trauma that I'm about to visit on you in the next few slides. So before we get to that though, some quick abbreviations. Um, you're going to see most of these abbreviations through the presentation at one time or another, and I will try when I'm speaking to use the full name, um, but especially with Proto-Indo-European, that's really a mouthful, so I tend to say pi. Uh, and on the right, sorry, on the left are abbreviations. On the right is some symbols that you might see. The asterisk, asterisk represents uh, a reconstructed word or phoneme. That means it's not a word or a phoneme that we have recorded in the historical record. It's a word or phoneme that we've had to kind of go back and apply different uh, linguistic laws to kind of estimate what that sounded like in a time before writing or in, an, in a situation where they didn't record that word. And then if you see something in those square brackets, uh, that's going to be international phonetic alphabet symbols. I won't be re requiring you to understand what IPA is or how it applies, just know that it exists. 
So second grade English, quick rehash, uh, remembering your parts of speech, a noun is a person, place, or thing, a verb is the action word, an adjective describes a noun, an adverb modifies the verb, um, prepositions, conjunctions, uh, think back to all those great um, songs that you had to learn, conjunction, junction, what's its function, right? Uh, articles are often not listed in parts of speech, but uh, articles or sometimes in linguistics, we call them determiners, are very useful things to think about and they'll be kind of important later on. Uh, and then parts of speech, you have the uh, parts of sentence, excuse me, parts of the sentence, you have the subject, it's the bit before the verb, and the predicate is the bit after the verb. That's a, a kind of reductive uh, discussion of that, but we're going to try and keep this at a, at a, a relatively um, basic level. Um, and then let's think about 11th grade English. If you've studied an inflected language before, so if you've studied Latin or uh, heaven help you Greek or Russian uh, or German, um, you will remember cases as this thing that somebody sat you down and made you memorize and just beat you over the head. Remember like uh, magna, magnum, magnae, Magnus, Magna, Magnus, right? You sit there and you're like, crap, I have to remember this forever. And you memorize a bunch of different paradigms. Um, so the nominative case, that's the the subject of the sentence. In in I guess let's let's back up a second. English doesn't have all the cases that Latin does, certainly not all the cases of Russian or Greek. Um, English really has four basic cases. Um, we've got different cases under those four, and then sometimes we talk about an instrumental case, but that's really faded away in modern English and it won't be particularly important. Um, in anything but Old English. So the nominative, the genitive, the accusative, and the dative. The nominative is the subject of the sentence, the subject of the phrase. The genitive is the verb, or sorry, the genitive is the possessive. The accusative is the uh, direct object of the verb. And the dative is often stated as the indirect object um, or uh, the, the, the sort of bit following most prepositions. Not all prepositions, but most prepositions. So I've kind of broken that sentence down for you. The man gives the spotted dog's bone to the brown bear and identified parts of speech, uh, which case that part of the word is, or part of the sentence is in, and then subject and predicate. I've also given for the visual learners, you can see in the red, that's the nominative. The green square rectangle is the accusative and the blue shape is the dative. Uh, so we're going to get a little bit more complicated. This stuff's useful. Uh, you don't really have to remember it, but it's it's useful to just have these ideas in your head. So what are verbal moods? So verbs can be uh, conjugated for tense, for aspect, and for mood. Uh, so a verbal mood uh, indicates an indicative verb, indicates action, an imperative verb. Listen, listen, right? Listen is imperative. It demands that you listen. It demands action. Passive is when the subject of the sentence is being acted upon by the verb. The subjunctive is tricky because we don't really use the subjunctive in English today, in modern English. But in Old English, the subjunctive was used fairly widely um, and in ways that we don't use it today. So today we use the subjunctive pretty much exclusively to state conditions contrary to fact. So if I were a carpenter, I would have built that out of maple. I'm not, but if I were, that's the subjunctive. Uh, Old English uses it in a number of different ways that I've listed there. What are some other fun things with verbs? You have the infinitive of the verb. Um, that's the basic unconjugated form of the verb, to run, to jump. In Old English, these are often ending in an. So uh, this is probably, I don't think this is actually an Old English word, but like running, jumping, right? Like it sounds, if you study German, rennen is the, you know, German. Um, quick aside, one of my favorite things in the world. So you remember the movie Chicken Run? In German, it was Hennenrennen, and that was beautiful. Uh, so participles. Participles is a non-finite verb that can act as an adverb or an adjective. So a non-finite form of the verb. So in modern English, we have two, the present and the past participle. Latin has, if I remember correctly, four. Um, in that's a nightmare. Uh, so present participle looks just like the gerund. Gerund is the ing form. Um, and it, we're going to talk about it in a second. Uh, so it looks just like the gerund, and it's used, for example, with auxiliary verbs to form the continuous aspect. So I am running. I am continuously running. I am running, running, running. It hasn't ended, and we just we know that that action continues. The past participle looks just like the simple past and is used as an auxiliary, for example, um, to form sort of a perfected aspect. So that, that action has ceased. It has happened, and it's done. It is perfect. 
Um, then the gerund is a verbal adjective. So you're taking a verb to groan and you're turning it into an adjective to describe a noun. So the groaning dog. So I went with a chart here instead of trying to explain everything individually. Tenses are time, aspects are how that action is unfolding. So continuous aspect, it is continuing to unfold. A simple aspect, it could be continuing, it could be stopped. It's, it's just sort of, this is the action in the moment. Um, perfect is a complete action. Perfect continuous is an action that happened continuously, but now it's ceased. So I had been, I have been going or had been going to the store every day but now I only go once a week. So in the past, I was continuously going to the store every single day, but now that action is complete, even though it was continuous, and today I only go once a week. Do you hate me yet? I hope not. So last little bit, consonants versus vowels. A consonant, this is kind of, there's gonna be a little bit of circular definition here. The, the main, thing to understand is a syllable. A syllable is a unit of speech that's interpreted by the listener as a single sound. So ba is a syllable, right? Ba. Now that's not one, that's not one individual uh, sort of tiny little bit, right? That's not just a, a b sound. You've got b and then you've got a vowel, ba. And you could make an argument that there's a, a voiceless bit on the end, but uh, ba, right? Uh, so, uh, so here you've got, it's, it's a very small thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be a whole word. Many words are made up of multiple syllables, um, but typically that syllable has a vowel and then some consonants. Sometimes it doesn't have to have consonants. It can be just a vowel. Um, and there are languages where you have consonant only uh, syllables, which in English is kind of like, we kind of do that. Um, but other languages, if you ever look at a language that uses a syllabary as its uh, writing system, you'll note that in almost every case, it's a consonant vowel combination. So I've gotten off topic. Um, a consonant is a sound that results from the passage of air through the restrictions of the oral cavity. Um, it's not the dominant sound of a syllable. Uh, the dominant sound of the syllable is generally a vowel. And then a vowel is a sound produced by the vocal cords with relatively little obstruct restriction in the oral cap uh, cavity, so that's your mouth, um, forming the prominent sound of a syllable. So consonants typically restricted and then vowels unrestricted. That makes it. And now we're all going to take a second. You can pause this video, take a second and just make noises with your mouth and feel kind of how that does. And you're like, oh, that's a vowel. And then you'll have experienced basically every linguistics class anybody on this planet has ever taken, because invariably there's a point where everybody's like, eh, e, e, and you're kind of pushing on your throat. And you're like, is that voiced? Is that unvoiced? Ooh, ah, eh. right. It's, it's very, we take it very seriously. I've also given you there the vowel chart because I, one thing I wanted to make clear is that when we're talking about vowels here, we're talking about more than just A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Um, we're talking about vowel sounds and what we consider a vowel linguistically, not just the vowels that we use in the alphabet. Um, so there's significantly more than just A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Uh, there's a whole range of, of additional sounds. All right, so boring uh, class stuff over with. Um, let us ex uh, continue into what kind of is my favorite, one of my favorite bits. It's not my favorite, but it's one of my favorites, and that's pi. Pi is Dean Winchester's favorite language, and thank you very much for letting me make that joke. So what do we know about Proto-Indo-European? Uh, pi is the reconstructed language that's believed to have been spoken about 3,500 years ago, eh, give or take about a thousand years. That's the common ancestor to approximately 445 living Indo-European languages. What does that mean? That means that all these languages are kind of derived in one way or another from Proto-Indo-European. Uh, if you look at the map there, you can see sort of an expanding set of boundaries. And that's one of the main theories about how, where uh, pro, uh, pi comes from. Um, in linguistics, we sometimes refer to that as the Erheimat because we use a lot of random German words for reasons that we're not gonna get into at the moment. Um, so that, that, that central area is the Erheimat and then it spreads out um, with these different cultures. Now, uh, there have been other origin stories postulated um, and we're never gonna be 100% sure about this because obviously no time machines. Um, 
but we know probably the speakers of Pi were maybe not an identifiable, a single identifiable people or tribe, um, but they probably shared some traits. So those traits include things like agriculture, animal husbandry, uh, transportation buyer across water, a climate with snow, a solid wheel, a sky god, oral heroic poetry, probably a patrilineal kinship system, and then a caste system. And why do we make those assumptions? We make those assumptions because those are concepts that are shared both in the Indo-Iranian and the European languages. And often the root words are shared. You can find that same root in some of these cases, both in Indo-Iranian and in European languages. Um, so snow is a fun example. Sky God is another. Deus is um, or Deus. Uh, those kind of things you can look at Sanskrit and there's very similar Sanskrit words to the the old uh, the oldest uh, European inscriptions it's it's fun this is basically this is my jam so when we talk about the, the Indo-European language family it's huge um, it, it's it's Oh, geographically one of the largest in the world um, and incorporates quite a lot of languages. I don't believe it's the largest linguistically, like when we talk about how many different languages are involved, but it, geographically it's very diverse and that's, that's to me that's pretty cool. Um, so we have the Indo-Iranian side and we have the European side and then we've got some other kind of weird bits stuck in there. So you've got Anatolian languages, that includes like Hittite. Um, you've got the Tokrian languages. Tokrian languages threw a huge wrench in the works at one point. So once upon a time they had the Sentum uh, Satum split and they had this theory and isogloss is a boundary where word, a word appears one way on one side and one way on the other. So in America we have like the bucket pail isogloss or the soda pop coke isoglosses right so we have these ideas about you know there's there's these physical not physical boundaries but there's essentially a boundary between where speakers use one word to describe something and on the other side of the boundary speakers use a different word to describe the same thing so once upon a time linguists had this theory about the centum satum split and they were like well clearly it's an east-west split this is how we know which if it's a centum language it belongs on this side if it's a satum language it belongs on that side we got this figured out. And then Tokrian shows up. And Tokrian was, Tokrian was a, if I remember correctly, a centum language on the wrong side of the split. And it threw a wrench in everybody's plans. And all of a sudden they had to reevaluate all of their theories and decided that maybe these changes happened sort of independently across languages at different times. And so it wasn't like there wasn't a giant split that just happened one day. It was like, oh, maybe these guys, maybe those guys. And then they kind of, their neighbors influenced each other. So you had different things popping up and then they sort of sort of homogenized. Um, so that's that's Tokrian and Tokrian's little adventure. So this is our closest, this is our tree. This is the Germanic language family, English. If you weren't aware already, English is a Germanic language. Yes, we have a lot of French vocabulary and vocabulary from other languages, but grammatically in our, in our core, we are a Germanic language. And you can find us there on the bottom right. We're under the Anglo-Frisian tree. Frisian is our nearest cousin. It's, our, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a sibling. Um, there's a fantastic saying in Fries uh, that is, uh, milk is to cheese as English is to freeze. Because cheese, so the fun thing here, cheese that just sound, if you look at Dutch, if you look at German, if you look at the Scandinavian languages, none of them say cheese. It's casa, or some close variant thereof. So there was a number of shibboleths as the Frisians and the Dutch were fighting that were basically like, well, you can't say, can you say cheese? And then the Dutch person would say, uh, keys? And they'd be like, ah, you're our enemy. Um, so it's it's this interesting little shared trait between us and the, the Frisians. Um, so you can also see on this, the the we're part of the Western Germanic group. Um, Northern Germanic is uh, the Scandinavian languages. Eastern Germanic, they're basically all dead. That also includes Gothic. Gothic's a lot of fun. It has some terrifying consonant clusters in it. GGW is the one that I sort of dream of on Terrible Nights. Um, and it is a very, very old language that we have a record of because the Bishop Ulfilus decided one day that he was going to translate the Bible into Gothic, uh, which is fantastic. So he worked from uh, Greek. So there's a lot of this weird underlying Greek grammar in that translation because there wasn't a good way to say it in Gothic. So he basically slapped Gothic words over this Greek grammar and was like, that works, uh, which it, it doesn't really, but it's an interesting way to understand how people were thinking when they were doing these translations. Um, so you also see Yiddish there. Um, Yiddish is a Germanic language. Uh, it's frankly, it's kind of one of my favorites because it's got just such great words, right? Schmutz. Uh, 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 
etc. Klutz. Like it's just the, they're words that feel good in the mouth. Um, and then Dutch and Flemish and Afrikaans and, and all the German languages all over the place. Good times. That's our group. I can do the slide. So how do we get from Pi to uh, English? What's the path we took? Um, also, this looks at, at sort of timelines. Uh, in linguistics, this is called the glottochronology. That word is included here because saying glottochronology is fun. So there's also a concept called the glottochronological constant, which obviously is, is, is a bit tricky to say, but it's a mathematical constant that you can apply to make reasoned guesses about how long a language, it takes a language to get from point A to point B. Um, I don't know how to apply it because that's not the part of linguistics that I ever got to. So pi, about 6,500 to 4,500 years ago, eventually that gives way to Proto-Germanic in the north. Uh, uh, the the Proto-Germanic Urheimat is believed to probably be sort of southern Scandinavia, um, but again, no time machine. So as late as 2,500 years before present. And you'll see on here YBP, that's years before present. Uh, so Northwest German, Germanic shows up 2,100, 2,200. Ingavonic, that's named for a particular tribe, the Ingavones, uh, 1,800, 1,600 years before present. Anglo-Frisian, 1,700 to 1,400. And then finally Old English. And you'll note after Old English, the timelines get shorter and the dates get a little bit more specific. And the reason that they do is because with Old English comes writing, uh, especially with the conversion to Christianity. Before that, they had been writing, but it hadn't been with the prolific, uh, um, the prolificness with the prolificness that they would after the conversion. So at this point, they start they start writing things down all over the place, and with written record, we get a much clearer idea of how language is changing, how quickly it's changing, and what the various steps look like. So Old English shows up about 1,500 years to, a, it disappears around 850 years before present. Uh, Middle English shows up about 950 years before present to about 500 years before present. And you'll note here too that there's overlaps in the dates. Um, I sort of went with about a hundred year overlap. And the reason for this is that language didn't, not everybody, you didn't wake up one morning and go, oh, we're speaking Middle English now, everybody, Middle English. Um, this is, it was a slow process. So Old English gave way eventually to Middle English, which gave way eventually to modern, early modern English about 600 years before present, which eventually gave way to modern English. Um, and you can, it's fun to look at the text because you can see those texts, and we'll, we'll look at a couple of those later, um, as they shift, as they lose traits from their earlier example and earlier, their ancestor language and move into sort of, oh, suddenly we're starting to see more and more of this. Okay, cool. And then you start to see the, the traits of the next one on the, the list. And it's, it is kind of fun to compare two texts, for example, that are in Middle English. They're both considered definitely Middle English texts, and one of them looks nothing like the other. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the glottochronology. Oh, and if you're curious, uh, the second word on each of those is the word for one or the postulated word for one. So it takes you from oinos, which is the postulated Proto-European word, through to modern English, one, and kind of gives you an idea of how that changed. So how does language change? How does this happen? Um, well, it happens because uh, people are imperfect. But how do we track that change? How do we understand it? Uh, linguists use a number of uh, linguistic rules or laws, sound laws, and we apply them sequentially to describe how sound changes occurred in the development of, of any language. Um, so for example, let's start with the postulated Proto-Indo-European paired. We know Jakob Grimm of the Grimm brothers uh, postulated that any chance, any place you see the P in Proto-Indo-European, in Proto-Germanic, you would see F. And that F is a bilabial fricative, so you're using your two lips. F, f, not like modern English where it's a labiodental, where you push that lower lip kind of under your teeth and go f. Um, so f, f eventually gives way to f. Um, and in Old English, we have attested feorting, but from that, we can make a reasonable guess about the 
form of the, the infinitive form of that verb, uh, which is feortan. In Middle English, we have attested fertan. And then we know that there's some uh, internal vowel mutations. We're going to talk about the great vowel shift. Um, loss of verb endings occur. And that takes us to modern English fart. And that shows up in 1768 in the uh, Dictionary of the English Language as just that, fart. What's interesting too here, really quickly, is that paired is not the only Proto-Indo-European word for fart. We had pest and paired, and one of them was the silent fart, and one of them was the loud fart. And I just, it amuses me greatly to know that 6,500 years ago, people were sitting around going, that was a, that was a silent stinker, my friend. That was, I think, silent as pest, and then loud as paired. Um, uh, versus the the loud and not so stinky ones. Um, so I've also given you a list here of some other examples that fit this pattern, uh, looking from the Old English to the Modern English. Heart looks like it doesn't fit the pattern, but when you pronounce the word heart, you'll note that that sa it's that same sound. You don't pronounce both the E and the A. So herta, heart, berken, bark, tioru, tar, steora, star. So, do we feel like we've understood how we got from Proto-Indo-European, from Pi, to what is personally my favorite, Old English? What? So, really quickly, uh, what means both what, like the question, or it's it's sort of a, a proclamation that you might make before speaking. Um, I have no idea if this gave way eventually to what, what? Um, I don't think it did, but it's nice to imagine. So what? Uh, it, it, Old English uh, is a Germanic language. It, it's as we've covered. Where did it come from? Germanic language speaking people from modern day Denmark, Netherlands, and Northwest coastal Germany, they arrive in Britain around uh, 410 CE, the early 400s. And there's a lot of debate about whether this was invasion or colonization. The, the traditional story goes that they were invited by Vortigern, Hengst, and Horsa, um, but that's mm, unlikely. Um, so they show up in England uh, in, in Britain around 410. There, at this point, there's likely an admixture of Britain and Latin vocabulary. Whether or not that vocabulary survived is kind of a big question mark, um, but it's it's very probable. Like you arrive in this territory, you would assume that there's going to be some uh, linguistic sharing. In, in linguistics, we talk about pigeons, which are trade languages, which give way to creoles, which is sort of a more advanced version of hybridization of two languages. Um, so there was probably a pigeon where they were to get supplies, right? Like to, to figure basic things out, right? You, you're going to end up working out something. Um, there is some interesting debates uh, in the last 10 years or so about whether or not there was any introduction at this point of British, here Celtic, uh, grammar into Old English. And it's, it's not a debate that I am really sure which side of it I fall on. I don't understand enough of it yet, um, but it's it's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, so there, and later we would have an admixture of Old Norse vocabulary, and that was, we know that for sure. Um, it's still present in our language today uh, and had a major impact, and that's the Dane law. The Dane law shows up, we're sharing an island, we're speaking languages that are fairly comprehensible, but not entirely. And uh, so now we're we're adding their vocabulary to us, to ours, um, starting off a uh, trend that we continue throughout the English language. Uh, so Old English, uh, sometimes called Anglo-Saxon or English, uh, spelled there with an SC, which is the digraph in Old English that represents the sh sound. Um, often it's cited as in Old English was the language of the people, Latin was the language of the church. However, we have a number of official documents, uh, specifically charters and church documents, uh, including the very famous sermon Ad Lupos at Angli, uh, Ad, Ad Lupos at Angli, which is a sermon that was uh, written, I believe, by Wolfstan. No, not by Wolfstan. Maybe by Wolfstan? I don't have it in front of me. I don't remember. It's underneath the camera, so we're not going to mess with that. Anyway, um, we have a number. Of, so we know that they're, they're writing sermons, presumably giving sermons in Old English. Um, they're writing official documents in Old English. This image on the screen there is a fantastic example from the British Library, where you've got the Psalms, they're written in Latin, and then somebody has gone through and glossed them in Old English, so that the, the priest, who may or may not be fluent in Latin, is able to understand what he is reading. Um, so this suggests that, at least among the educated classes, there was literacy both in Old English and then, to some extent, in Latin. Um, 
And that's, that's kind of a fantastic thing to think about because through history, English has sometimes been kind of derided as less uh, good, not obviously modern history, but um, in like the 1600s, they were having huge debates about English isn't really a good language. It's not as good as Latin or French. These are languages of the educated people. English is just sort of meh. But here we have an example early on of people saying, you know what? I don't really understand Latin. You don't really understand Latin. Let's do it in Old English and writing in Old English. And as a linguist and a scholar of the language, I am deeply grateful that these people thought that they should write it in Old English because now we have a great record uh, of of language that we can look at. There's also, of course, a lot of Anglo-Saxon poetry, some great riddles. There's one about the a garlic cellar, which is one that I just giggle about every time. But again, we're getting off topic. So historically, when we talk about the historical period, the Anglo-Saxon period, uh, or the early medieval English period, we talk about that ending at about 1066. If you don't know why it ended in 1066, we will cover that later. So uh, just sort of visual people, you can see there, there's the Utes, the Saxons, the Angles. These are the folks who arrived in England. They settled places like Anglia and Essex and Sussex and Wessex. Um, oddly, the Utes didn't really give their name to anything, so go figure. Um, you'll also see there how close we are to the Frisians. And uh, that is, you know, there's your explanation why English and Frisian are so closely related. And so here's a, a fun sentence. Hello, my name is Kinehild in English. Hoi, my name is Kinehild in Frisian. So a little bit of beer and you can largely understand, you can largely understand it. So what does Old English look and sound like? Uh, let's start with an audio example. Maybe. Nope. Why can't I? Okay. All right. So somehow I managed to break something, so I can't go back a screen. Uh, so if you're watching this on a video, um, which I assume you are, uh, rewind the video a second and take a look at it. Um, so what uh, what does it look and sound like? So initially Anglo-Saxon or Old English is written using the Anglo-Saxon runes, what we call today Thuthork. Uh, they're used to write Old English and Old Frisian beginning around the 5th century. They're used in England up until about the 9th century, though there are examples as late as the 10th or 11th. Their, Latin, their replacement by the Latin alphabet begins in about the 7th century. So the Latin alphabet for Old English is introduced with Christianity. Uh, its script was typically uh, insular minuscule. That was the by and large, the script for, for Old English. Insul, unsul was uh, regard, reserved almost entirely for Latin um, and insular minuscule for uh, Old English. There's a whole concept called the hierarchy of scripts, which I am not going to get into, but I would encourage you to look up later. Uh, it retained the runic character win for the w sound. Uh, the runic thorn and the non-runic ev are both used somewhat interchangeably for the th sound. And then the non-runic ash, which is an a and e ligature, uh, was used considered an independent vowel. And for what it sounds like, let me, since I can't play the audio sample, you're going to get some off the cuff Old English reading. Um, let me see if I can find something that I have practiced. All right, something I've practiced. Wayland Himbe Wurman, Rakas Kunanda, Anhuge Earl Eartha Dreach, Hefte him to Yasitheth, Sorga and Langath, Winter Kail the Raka, Hueon on oft offond, Sithan Hina Nithad on Neda Legda, Swankra Seno Banda on Sulin Mon. Thus of Reoda, this is Swamai. So that's the first uh, stanza from Deor and translates as Wayland knew the torment of the serpents upon him. Resolute man, he had suffered hardships. He had sorrow and longing for his companions. And the pain of the winter cold he often encountered in the pain of the winter cold, he often encountered misfortune, since Neithad had laid constraints upon him, supple sinew bonds upon the better man. As that was passed over, so as that passed over, so can this. So some examples. Sorga is sorrow. Uh, longath is longing, uh, winter kelda is winter cold, 
uh, raka, uh, you're racked, you might say today, you're racked with tremors or something like that. Raka is here, sort of the pain of it. Um, Uro uh, is Earl today. So the resolute man, Anhida Uro. Uh, anyway, so there's, there's a little bit of Anglo-Saxon for you, Old English. So what is under the hood? What does Old English look like uh, sort of linguistically and grammatically when we think about it, not necessarily as a poetic language? Initially, it's what's called a synthetic language. Synthetic here doesn't mean fake or created. What it means instead is a language that uses inflection or agglutination. Old English uses inflection um, to indicate where words fall in a sentence, the syntactic relationship between them. So nouns in Old English are declined for five cases, the nominative, accusative, genitive, dative, and instrumental, though at this point the instrumental is really dropping away and it shares an ending with dative in, in nearly all cases. Uh, there's three grammatical genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter. Um, two grammatical numbers, singular and plural. There are some early texts that demonstrate a third number, which is dual. So single, I, dual, us two, plural, us. Um, Adjectives must match the noun that they modify for case, gender, and number. So this is called concord. Um, and again, if you've studied any inflected languages, you will know that that's a lot of your time is making sure that everything matches correctly. Uh, verbs are conjugated in, th in three persons, first, second, third person, and two numbers, singular and plural. And verbs must match their subjects in both person and number. So really quickly, something to always remember, Grammatical gender does not mean gender as we might apply it to something alive. So gender here means noun class. I don't know why back in the day somebody decided to apply gender, but it's as the as sort of the concept, but I think it was it was easy, right? You're like, oh, what has two things, masculine and feminine. Um, but Grammatical gender does not refer to the gender of the object in any way. So a great example from German is Mädchen. Mädchen means a, a maiden, a young girl. Mädchen is neuter because it ends in C-H-E-N. Um, here, uh, like Wief is neuter, Wiefmann is masculine. Uh, both of those mean woman. Uh, so divorce in your mind all concepts of what we might typically consider gender from grammatical gender. If you need to think of them as noun cases, noun classes, excuse me. Uh, so we also have strong and weak nouns. There's nothing objectively strong about a strong noun. Um, it's only sort of useful and con uh, sort of opposing opposition to weak nouns. Um, again, not, not really weak, weak, but they, their, their forms are a little different. So it's a way of distinguishing paradigms within a single language. There's a handful of irregular and indeclinable nouns. One of them is men, M-A-N-N, -N, which means a person. So man, men, it's a I stem, I believe. And then you also have a positive nouns. Positive nouns aren't necessarily declined differently, but they're applied a little differently in the sentence. So positive nouns, which are like nicknames and titles, uh, typically appear in the pattern name, nickname. So Alfred Kuning. So you wouldn't say King Alfred, you would say Alfred King. Uh, if you're a fan of Lord of the Rings, it's a pattern you're going to recognize, especially from Rohan. Um, so I've given you two declination examples here. One of them is strong masculine uh, and one of them is weak feminine. And the reason specifically that I've picked weak feminine here is because it's one of my favorite examples. So in English, we say ox and the plural of ox is oxen. The reason the plural of ox is oxen is because ox in Old English was a weak feminine noun. So we still to this day use that declension. Verbs. So a little bit of nouns, a little bit of verbs. Again, we have strong verbs and weak verbs. There's some theories about the strong verb being sort of the older verbs, um, but mm, uh, they demonstrate though an internal umlaut, internal vowel, vowel mutation. So sing, sang, sung. Uh, that, that changing in the internal vowel is how we classify different strong nouns. And there's seven classifications for strong nouns and then three weak nouns. The weak nouns don't necessarily show that internal mutation. Uh, subjunctive, yes, they had the subjunctive, and like we mentioned earlier, they used it all the time and marked it separately, inflected separately for it. They did not, however, have a future, an explicit future tense. So Latin totally has a future tense. Modern English, we have to use auxiliary verbs to kind of build that future tense. And in Old English, you kind of use auxiliary verbs and you mostly just use context. So if you say, I go to the store next week, obviously that 
that trip to the store is going to happen in the future. But there's no change to the, the verb, right? I go to the store now. I go to the store next week. That's the context. Um, so we talked a little bit about the subjunctive earlier, so we're not going to get into it more now. And in the, as I just mentioned, be kind of context and auxiliary verbs. In Middle English, uh, as, sorry, as in Modern English, uh, there's a couple of verbs like don, gan, and huilan, do, go, and desire, that have anomalous conjunction patterns. There's another one we're going to talk about here in a second that's very anomalous. Um, but on the example that I've given you, this is a uh, class four strong noun, uh, brecken, and you, you can see that, so breke, brixt, and brak. Those are all that, that internal mutation. To be, also to be, that is the question. So uh, Old English uses three verbs for to be, but he, they use them all in slightly different ways. So they act kind of as a single verb, but not exactly. They're, they're from three different Proto-Indo-European roots. Beon has no preterite form, no past form at all, uh, and it's kind of used to state the gnomic present, which are sort of permanent truths, uh, also more frequently used to form the future. I, uh, I will be, blah, blah. Um, obviously, there's multiple auxiliary verbs in the modern English. Uh, it comes from a Proto-Indo-European root, meaning to become, to grow, or to appear. For survivals in modern English, look at being, uh, ben and being. Uh, so, and wesan is, here you'll see there's two listed, but they're from three roots. So wesan uh, has a present and a preterite form, a past form. It's an amalgamation of th uh, two pi verbs that sort of occurred, the amalgamation occurred prior to the emergence of Old English. So one of them was uh, the simple to be, and that survived as its present form of wesan. And the other one was sort of to dwell, to live, or to reside, and that survived as the past form of wesan. Uh, negated examples, uh, you can negate the, the present form of uh, Wesan, so you can uh, you can say instead of is, you can say niz or nas or nara, um, and that's it's sort of like a conjunction. And then in survivals in model, modern English, you can look at am and were and is and all this stuff. So here you can see all three forms of the verb to be. Uh, you have the two present and the one past, uh, and all their, their fun. And you, you'll, if you look at it, you can kind of start to see where modern English has uh, borrowed, or not borrowed, where, where it has survived in modern English. Excuse me. Sentence order. So because it's an inflected language, you'll occasionally hear people argue that you don't need to worry about sentence order at all. This isn't really the case. You do need to worry about sentence order. Uh, it needs to be subject, verb, and then object, most typically, or you can do verb, subject, object. Uh, that's in modern English, you'll hear that a lot as a question. Are you sleeping? Uh, and then sometimes you can split the, the verb all the way to the end, like they do in German, right? So, ich habe der Film gesehen. I have blah, 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 seen. That was probably very bad German. Please don't tell. Uh, Herr Kimball. Um, so the, the, the finite verb appears at the end or the uh, or towards the end of the sentence. Auxiliary verbs in Eng modern English we try and keep our auxiliary verb so the the verbal and the auxiliary verb together. Uh, in Old English you don't have to do that if you don't feel like it. So you can have um, I am to the store going and that's totally fine. In modern English you sound like you forgot what you were saying. So that's kind of what I'm going to cover for Old English, and we're going to move into Middle English next. But before we do, I wanted to give you a couple of good online resources. Um, the Old English Aerobics goes with one of the books I'm recommending at the end, which is An Introduction to Old English by Baker. Uh, it's a fantastic website, especially when used in conjunction with the book. It gives you uh, sort of real-time feedback on how you're understanding and learning. Uh, Anglo-Saxon Allowed is uh, a project of uh, Michael Drought, Professor Michael Drought at uh, Wheaton College, and he's going going through and he's read almost the entire corpus of Anglo-Saxon poetry. Um, so you can hear it. If you sit there and you listen to it, you can hear it and that will accustom you to its pronunciation. Um, and I believe, if I remember correctly, mostly he uses the West Saxon dialect, um, but occasionally he will use other dialects and note that in the recording. And then the last one I've got here for you is the University of Texas's Linguistic Research Center. It's an absolute gem for any of these early Indo-European languages. So they've got a Gothic site, but then they also have an Old English site and Old Norse. Um, 
lessons. Uh, there's no uh, workbook, unfortunately, but there's there's plenty of information as well as glossaries and other uh, resources for self-directed learning. So I completely recommend them. And obviously, because of all of this uh, COVID stuff, they're facing some real budget issues. So if you use their site, I would strongly encourage you to toss them a couple bucks because they provide an amazing resource and they do it for free. Well, free to the user. So next up, Middle English. This is sort of, this is English's teen years. This is when we got moody and weird. So we talked, I talked earlier about we were going to get to the Battle of Hastings. Well, we've got there. 1066, King Harold Godwinson dies on the field. William the, of Normandy, uh, the bastard, led his Norman forces to victory and established this new regime in England. There's been some really interesting, like when I was doing the research for this class, I found a couple of very interesting uh, arguments online about whether or not William the Conqueror wanted to Normanify England or he wanted to keep England English. And I see no evidence that he wanted to keep England English. It's sure, guys, sure, no. Um, so anyway, with the Norman invasion, the Norman Anglo-Norman dialect becomes the prestige language and the, a bunch of new vocabulary was added to English. So we, we gained a lot of uh, French-based or Norman-based terms fairly quickly, changed our grammar a little bit, and all of a sudden we're speaking Middle English. Well, not all of a sudden. As we mentioned earlier, it's a slow process. So what does it look and sound like? And now we're back to Claire trying to read in Middle English. So exclusively it's written with the modified Latin alphabet. Um, they start using basically the same alphabet they were using for Old English and eventually drop sound, drop letters. And it gets to looking more like the alphabet we use today. So Ev is the first to go. It drops off in the 13th century. Thorn is basically gone in the 14th, though it sticks around a little bit. And it sticks around particularly in some interesting cases of ligatures. Uh, so the most uh, famous example of that is in Y, uh, is how people, or Y is how people often pronounce it, as in Ye Old Shop. Um, but here the Y-E is not a Ye, it's the Y is representing the thorn, so it's the, the old shop. So if you go somewhere and you see ye old shop, please feel free to point out to them, if they're pronouncing it ye old shop, that they're pronouncing it wrong. Um, don't be afraid, just do it. So uh, they've also retained the long S from the insular minuscule, and they in eventually introduced the short S, so now you have two forms of the letter S. Uh, they've introduced the yog, um, Really, they've introduced the, the continental G, um, which is the G with the loops. So you've got, you have the pre-existing insular minuscule G, which is the sort of big Z looking thing. Um, and then you've got the G with the loops. And so they're like, well, now we've got two Gs. So they start using the Z, the yog, uh, to represent some different sounds. So you won't see it necessarily uh, in everywhere you would expect to see a G. Um, it's more of a, like a Y or Z sound. Um, the K, Q, and Z all appear from sources on the continent, alphabet sources on the continent. They also attempt to sort out the hard G, soft G issue by introducing a J, but they don't introduce it clearly and they don't introduce it with any kind of permanence, so it really just confuses matters. Uh, Carolingian minuscule replaces insular minuscule as the document hand fairly early on, and then this is later replaced by what we today call the chancery hand. Um, or uh, batard uh, sometimes. Uh, well, batard and chancery hand aren't the same thing. But uh, so batard is one example, chancery hand is the other. Um, and then later inventions like Gothic quadrata replace uncial as the standard book hand. So book hand is like a, a formal script, and the the handwriting is the chancery hand. So what did uh, Middle English sound like? I am very bad at Middle English, and so I'm going to bungle this pretty terribly, and I am sorry. As I come by and way, hof on each hair de say, full mori mond and proud, whis he wears of Laura and gothliche under Gora and clothed in fair shroud. Um, so that's the very beginning of uh, Dame Sirith. And as I come by a road of, I don't really know what that reads, and I'm pretty bad at reading Middle English to Modern English on the fly, so. Um, I'm going to pause this recording, do some practice reading, and come back in just a second. Okay, I have apparently picked something a little bit beyond what I'm able to pull together in a few seconds. So, 
I'm very sorry. But the words that we're looking for here, sound, similar words, proud uh, is proud. Um, uh, lore uh, here means history or learning. So lore is a word obviously we use today. Uh, wise he was of lore, so he was very learned. Uh, uh, and Gothic under Gora, so and handsome under his his clothes. So Gora here is clothes. But then we also have clothed, which clothed, clothed, right? So there's a little bit of like we're trying to rhyme things and being weird about it. Uh, so a way is a road. Uh, have on I heard say. Uh, anyway, uh, before I get distracted and we turn this turns into Claire attempting to translate on the fly, let's move on to the next slide. Maybe. There we go. Uh, so Middle English is not, you know what? Did I start recording again? Yes. Uh, Middle English is not unlike to the Q continuum. If you don't know what the Q continuum is, then you are missing out. So uh, what does that kind of continuum look like? You've got an early 12th, late 12th century example. So this is not long. This is 100 years after the Norman invasion. New brother Walter brother mean after the flesh is kind and brother me in Christendom, thurk folked and thurk trotha and brother me in goddess hoost yet oh they breed a three the wise. So here you can it sounds very much like old English. Um, you're also seeing a lot of double consonants. Those double consonants mean that the vowel preceding them is short. This is not a spelling uh, standard that stuck around for any length of time. Spelling convention, that's what I was looking for. So then you have late middle, uh, late, uh, later Middle English. This is late 14th century English. This is the Canterbury Tales. Juan Apro with his shoulder sota, and drochte in the march had hath pierced to the rota, and bathed every vine in sweet liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the fleur, when Zephyrus eke in his sweetest breath, sweeter breath, in spirit hath in every halt and hate, and that's the most I can see before it's covered up by more stuff on the screen. Um, so now it's starting, you're starting to catch more things that sound like modern English. Um, the spelling is starting to look much more like what we're used to. The, the unusual characters are dropping away. So this is starting to look more like early modern English. We're starting to feel more like, oh, this is okay. Cool. We got this. What are the changes going on? So it's Middle English is still an inflected language, but those inflections are getting less obvious. There's a really great argument about why English loses its inflections. And the argument goes that because of the Dane law, because these Scandinavians moved in in the north of England, the languages that they were speaking, the languages that we were speaking, had a lot of common vocabulary, but the word endings were, were the, the inflected endings were not the same at all. And so people eventually were just like, you know what? I'm going to go with horse, or which in Old Norse, if I remember correctly, is horsa, and we're just going to go, or it might be the other way around, horsa and horse, uh, and we're just going to drop all the inflections and rely on word order a little bit more to kind of get this point across. So that's that's one of the theories about why English eventually loses its inflections, though obviously they're still sticking around in the 14th century. Uh, so losing those inflections, weak, strong noun and adjective declensions are disappearing and in many cases regularizing, but they do still exist to a certain extent. Uh, there's a distinction for the second person plural pronoun that still exists. So in modern day English, we have you as in one of you, or in some areas we have y'all, uh, which refers to all of you or all y'all. Um, but in the places like where I live, we just have you and you. Uh, in, in English that was historically you had you and well you had thou and you uh, so the pronoun declension especially the third person pronoun is incredibly varied and that's often a hallmark you can look at with a text to determine which dialect that text was written in is what pronouns are they using um, one of the things that we're seeing in middle english is the eventual replacement of the feminine heo with she so heo does not sound like the third person feminine pronoun today but she does uh, genitive of a complex noun phrase was a split construction. So a complex noun phrase is like the King of England. So if you wanted to make a genitive with the King of England, maybe talking about the Queen, the King of England's wife is how we would say it today, but in Middle English you would say the King's wife of England. So King is the geni is uh, King of England is, is one uh, noun phrase, um, but we're splitting the King's bit and then putting what the King possesses immediately after it and then going on with the rest of that noun phrase. So then thou and you, we talked, I just talked about that a second ago. 
starting at the beginning of the start of, around the start of the 14th century, singular thu or the uh, came to indicate an informal register, and the plural ye became uh, sort of came to indicate a, a formal register. So that's where in like fair speak you might have v versus you. Uh, v you would uh, talk to your friends, um, or if you want to maybe insult somebody who is sort of socially higher than you, you say v. Um, but you is sort of the formal you. Uh, if you've done German, um, du and z, uh, French, uh, I can't remember French, that's embarrassing, but French, Spanish, these all have them. Um, verb conjugations are simplifying, vu is the formal, I don't know, that's going to be embarrassing for a while. Uh, verb conjugations are simplifying and to the extent possible regularizing. We do have strong and weak verbs uh, still distinct um, and the subjunctive is an inflected form still. Sentence order is becoming more fixed with the loss of inflection. We've got internal sound changes and we've got a significant influence of uh, especially French and Latin derived vocabulary. So what does this look like? If you look at these, on the left we've got declensions, on the right we have conjugation. Um, you can see the changes that are happening in the declension systems. So uh, on the left is Old English, on the right is Middle English, and you can see the same kind of changes happening in uh, the verb. So let's talk quickly about spelling. This is, as a linguist, this is one of the questions I get most frequently. Why does English sound the way it does? Why is English spelled the way it does? Why do the, none of the spellings seem to match how you pronounce the words? It's stupid and we don't like it. So the problem is, in 1476, this guy, William Caxon, who was at the time the governor of the Company of Merchant Adventurers, which may be my favorite historical title of all time, uh, introduced to England a Gutenberg-style printing press. He printed and, and wrote, he was a very prolific translator, uh, in the London dialect of English. So that's kind of where a lot of our spelling comes from, is that it began to be calcified in the late, for, in the late 15th century in London. He produced a huge variety of works. So not just documents for the church or for the elite, but he was also producing basically sort of trashy romances and stuff and just they made books suddenly became very cheap. We had already a fairly decent sized literary population because with the growth of cities and the merchant class you have to have literacy. You cannot run a merchant house if you can't read um, or more importantly write records, write reports. Um, so suddenly all these people who had been kind of learning to read and learning basic letters and stuff like that to, to run their businesses had access to to fiction and and nonfiction uh, such as it was um, and and just this huge wealth of of books and so with books which is fantastic uh, unfortunately you start to sort of solidify spelling conventions because now people can look at a word and they're like oh that's how you spell that I've always been spelling it this way but this is printed much like on the internet today when somebody's like I saw it on the internet so it's true right they're like I saw it in the book and that looks like the right way to do it to me so you also have you have that problem then you also have kind of a uh, suddenly there's not the proliferation of scribal errors. And if everything's getting printed in, in centralized locations, you're not gonna have as many regional dialects, um, their spelling preserved. Uh, so, so that's kind of, eh. um, but uh, it's important to remember that the, the written word does not necessarily reflect the spoken language. So now we've got kind of two registers of speak, speech, we've got, or two registers of language, we've got written language and spoken language. And the two have to do with each other, but they're not necessarily the same. There's a great example from William Caxton's lifetime. He recounts a time when he was on a boat sailing from London to Zealand and it was calmed. He landed on the Kent side of the Thames and a grocer named Sheffield, uh, who was from the north of England, went to a house and asked the, the woman of the house if he could buy some eggs, some eggs. And she replied that she could speak no French. And this annoyed him because the, the French word in modern French is oeuf, so clearly it's not agus, uh, and he couldn't speak French either, so he wouldn't have known about oeuf, which means he wouldn't have known about my favorite joke, which I'll tell you at the end. Uh, a bystander suggested that Sheffield was in fact asking for iron, uh, and the woman understood that that meant eggs, and so 
he recorded, he thought about this, Caxton thought about this and recorded that, you know, lo, what should a man do in these days now write? Should he write agus or iron? Certainly it's hard to please everyone because the diversity and change of language. Um, so he's, ra he's, he's dealing with this issue already. Uh, and that, that kind of fascinates me. And so here's my joke. Uh, what do you, what do they eat? Uh, why do they only eat one egg uh, for breakfast in France? Because in France, one egg is enough. Yeah. So that's part of the spelling problem. Here's the other part of the spelling problem, uh, the Great English Vowel Shift, sometimes called the Great Vowel Shift. Uh, so between about 1400 and 1700, the value of English long vowels changed significantly. Why? Eh, we don't know. Um, some scholars point to the rapid migration of people after the Black Death. Uh, some argue that it was just sort of the natural consequence of an increasing amount of French vocabulary. Um, but within that chain, sort of the French vocabulary thing, we have this very interesting idea that it may have been the increasing prestige of the French language among the middle class that led them to sort of hyper-correct their language, sort of trying to sound French, but because they didn't necessarily speak French, they didn't sound French correctly. So they, they came up with these inaccurate imitations of French pronunciations, and that changed, over time, that changed the quality of our vowels. Uh, Others still argue that it was actually anti-French sentiments that drove people to make a conscious decision to make English sound less French. So it had been kind of skewing French and all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's 1400s, 1415 is the Battle of Agincourt. Uh, suddenly they're like, no, guys, we don't want to sound French. Let's fucking Frenchies. And they like swerve and they, they start changing the language and changing the vowels. And over time, that caused the vowel shift. So early processes include uh, diphthongization of close vowels. Diphthongization is where you have a, a simple, a pure vowel. Um, and that goes from one sound to two sounds acting in concord. So a good example of a diphthong here is uh, like boat, oat. Oh, that's that's not one sound. There's uh and u, uh, and they're acting together. Oh, um, so that's a diphthong. No, not diphthong. Diphthong. Um, and then you had sort of the raising of the close mid, open mid, and open vowels. If you go back to the beginning of this when we're done, feel free to take a look at uh, that vowel chart, and that'll kind of explain what an open uh, mid, close mid, and open vowels are. Uh, later, vowels began merging together, so not only has the sound, the quality of the vowel changed, but we've also sort of, we're losing vowels. They're, they're merging together, and we have fewer vowels today than we did in Middle English. This does not help the spelling situation, because in some instances, you have a vowel represented uh, orthographically, so A-E-I-O-U, that's representing how it sounded maybe in the 1500s. Um, and so they were like, mm, sounds like this, so that's how they spelled it. But today, that vowel has changed, or we've maybe lost that particular vowel. And so we're like, uh, uh, this does not look and sound the same. So. This is a, for the visual folks, this is a, a visualization of how those vowels changed. Um, this is from the, the Wikipedia article on the Great Vowel Shift. And you can kind of see there, we start in 1400 with lots of vowels, and then those numbers decrease until today. So that's kind of all I'm going to talk about with Middle English. Um, some online resources, fantastic online resources. Uh, Tolkienprofessor.com really does focus more on the fantasy realms of Tolkien, but like the man himself, it expands to kind of talk a little bit about Middle English, and they have some really good recorded lectures, so I'd encourage you to check those out. The, the University of Michigan's Middle English Compendium is the only thing that the Univers University of Michigan has ever done well. Um, it's an amazing resource. It combines robust dictionary and a digital corpus. I'm a very frequent visitor of their website. Um, I think it's, I really do think it's outstanding. And then the University of Rochester has the, the Teams project uh, where they've, they've got not just several texts, but they've also got annotated audio versions. So you, you're watching the text as you're hearing it, which I find very, very useful for learning the pronunciation. You're seeing the word, you're hearing it pronounced. I like it. So check those out. The last stop we've got on this journey is early modern English. Well, we're going to do a little bit after this, but Early modern English, which I, this is, this is, I will be honest with you right now, early modern English is the one that I am least familiar with of these three. Um, so this is the one we're going to cover in the least detail, frankly. 
what does uh, early modern English look and sound like? Well, they have kept some of the conventions from Middle English. They've also introduced what the Germans today call an S set for a ligature of double S. So that's the long S and then a short S, and those just sort of loop together and suddenly you get the S set. Um, U and V, uh, V is frequently found at the start of words and U elsewhere. So uh, the two letters, even though V, was absolutely a sound that we had. Um, we're not using, we're sometimes we're saying love, L-O-U-E, and then we're also using U as a, a vowel. Um, I and J differentiation, we revisit differentiating between I and J and, and how do we use the J. Uh, it begins about the 1630s. The last few remnants of the thorn are still hanging on in a couple of ligatures. Silent E starts to get added just randomly to some words, apparently for the aesthetic, because that's what English spelling needed. Um, and then we, for typing, for, for printed uh, words, because at this point we're really moving away from a uh, handwritten manuscript almost exclusively to printed manuscripts. Um, they're using a black letter for the early typefaces, that's that sort of Gothic looking text. But then Italy starts looking at their, their uh, classical past and they develop some of these great neoclassical fonts. Um, and those are eventually uh, uh, brought to England, the, the Roman and the Italic font specifically. And that, that example there on the bottom left is a Roman font. And then just as a kind of neat nod to today, today we use the Garamond font, uh, or you can. Um, and Claude Garamond developed his typeface around 1541 to about 1592. And that typeface is very, very, very similar to the Garamond font that we use today. So 1590s, we were like, yeah, that's a good looking font. And you know what? They weren't wrong. A handwriting remains vaguely Batard-esque, so you've got that handwriting example there, which I think is quite pretty, just an FYI. Uh, I don't have an example of audio because I really don't know how to pronounce early modern English. It's not my skill set. Um, I had an audio recording, but it's as with the previous ones, it doesn't seem to be working. Um, so. I encourage you, I've got a website listed at the end here called Original Pronunciation, um, and from there you can find some links to audio recordings. I encourage you, if you're curious, go check that out. Or look up like Original Shakespeare Pronunciation. It's another good example. So looking at sort of, the, again, we've got a continuum of, of language change. In 1485, Lamorde Arthur, that's uh, Caxon, we talked about earlier, was the editor, Mallory, the, the author, hit befell in the days of Uther Pendragon, when he was king of all England. So was Regan there, that there was a mighty duke in Cornwall that held war against him in a long time. So we've got some of the weird characters are still there, the Yog, um, it's it's still their construction is not quite the same. Um, most of the words are pretty identifiable, uh, though we don't say today that they held war against somebody they waged war is what we would say today, um, or for a long time. So you're noticing there's some weird prepositional use there or lack of prepositional use. And then when we look at the 1592 example, when this eternal substance of my soul did live imprisoned in my wanton flesh, each in their functions serving others' needs, I was a courtier in the Spanish court. My name was Don Andrea. My descent, though not ignoble, was yet inferior far to gracious fortunes of my tender youth. For there in prime and pride of, and pride in all, of all my years, duty, and by duteous service and desiring love, blah, blah, blah. Um, so suddenly, Yes, yeah, spelling's still a little weird. We've got the UV thing going on. Um, there's only one vowel in each. Uh, this is really becoming very comprehensible to the modern ear. It sounds like English. It sounds like archaic English, uh, or like somebody's trying to talk fancy, but it sounds like English. And, and you can take away, without any knowledge of how to read early Middle English, almost the entire concept of what you're understanding what they're saying. So. Grammar, it's increasingly, simplifying really isn't the right word. English grammar isn't simple, um, but it's its losing, it's continuing to lose that inflection. So pronouns have become essentially the same as they are in modern English, though they are continuing to use the formal you and informal the. Um, there's a gradual, the, the, the it, the, sec, the third person neuter pronoun has at this point been searching for a possessive. Um, uh, it had been his for a while, but obviously that was causing some confusion. Thereof, 
uh, was tried out for a bit. There was a number of other options. Uh, eventually, though, they went with it's. So suddenly we've got it's. Almost all noun inflection is gone, apart from the s plural and genitive s, uh, much like in modern English. Um, Occasional use of the possessive dative shows up. So an example of this would be Moses, his meekness, Abraham's faith. So Abraham's faith is Moses' weak meekness kind of structure there. Uh, genitive involving uh, complex noun phrases suddenly look like they do in modern English. So the wife of the king of England. Now you can move king of England or king of England's wife. You can That whole complex noun phrase can be kept together. Verb conjugations continue to simplify. The th ending becomes essentially obsolete and really only used when people want to sound archaic. The uh, plural present loses its inflection entirely. Second person indicative retains its st ending for a while, but as thou drops out of use, so does that st ending. So now we're saying you, so just you are. Uh, modal auxiliaries, or you jump, I guess, would be instead of you jumpest, thou jumpest, you jump. Uh, so modal auxiliaries are, uh, without an infinitive, becoming increasingly rare, as is the way that they're used uh, to indicate tense or aspect. We've also got uh, occasional uh, use of a pre prefix a to indicate uh, continuous. So I was a walking. Um, a walking is like in today we might like I hear people say frequently to go a Viking. That's not really an old English construction. That's a Middle English construction, but it sounds ye olde, so we to do a uh, something. And then there's some weak ver verbs, uh, previously weak verbs, that actually are cr are made to sound like um, strong verbs. So they, they go through, they back form this internal mutation. So dig is a great example. Dig, dug. Phonology. The phonology is continuing to get weird. Um, so you've got the continuing adventure that is the Great English Vowel Shift. You've got some examples of yod dropping. That's the deletion of the y sound from certain syllable clusters. So do, do, and do, d-o, d-e-w, and d-u-e, didn't used to be homophones. But eventually we dropped the y from some of them, and now suddenly they all sound the same. Uh, there is some examples of monophthongization and diphthongization. Um, we covered diphthongization. Monophthongization is the opposite um, action. So you go from a diphthong to a monophthong. Um, nature rhymed with letter, at least for a while, and there was a couple other examples of this. You'll find in, especially when you look at like um, Shakespeare, where things sound like they should rhyme, but in modern English you're reading, you're like, nature, letter, these aren't the same. But netter, letter, those do rhyme. Uh, there's a loss of roticity. So early early modern English, Middle English, was likely almost entirely rhotic. Um, rhotic here means the r, regular, regularly, regulates regulations, right? So, however, early modern English, you start to lose some of that roticity. So suddenly, we're start, you've got people who are starting to sound like they pocked the ka and bahavid yad, that y, ah, ah, there's no r, right? Um, so now, you also have the, the, what today is a silent l, um, as in would or should, it was pronounced. So, should, wold, that's why that L is there today. You also have the loss of the H in words like night, so or nicht uh, uh, in Old English. Um, so if you've ever wondered why is night or knichtas is, is a, a knight is in a man on a horse, um, why is that spelled with that GH uh, in there? That's because they're trying to represent that H sound. So nicht, uh, well, H, we know it's the place of articulation is velar, so that's where we make the g sound, uh, the, the velar stop, g, k. Uh, so let's let's put it in the velar place of articulation, and then let's add a symbol to indicate that it's not, it's a fricative, it's not a, a velar stop, like a g. So you, you use the, the g and the h together, and that represents that single sound, h, like using a t and an h together, th. Um, so that, that was the thinking, but we've lost that pronunciation. So now when you look at why is night spelled that way, it's very frustrating. Speaking of frustrating spellings, why does night, as in the man on the horse, have a K at the beginning? It's because it used to be knichtes, uh, or knicht. And once upon a time, it meant sort of an unruly boy. And that amuses me every day. So knicht uh, was pronounced the K and the N, or my personal favorite example, knutsen. Uh, you say the K, and 
kiss the you over the DSEM. Uh, so Knutsen, Knecht, uh, used to, it used to be Knecht, and now we've we've got those hallmarks, those spellings that that sound and we, uh, preserved in our spelling, but we say knight today. So it's like, why is there a K in knight? Well, because I, I beat that horse to death. Vocabulary. Vocabulary just is growing. There's this great debate called the Inkhorn debate that sort of goes off and on through the early modern period. And the, the question here is, if there is a word that exists in English already, a, a Germanic word, uh, and we introduce a new word from French or Latin or Greek, uh, and you sort of replace the Germanic word with that word because it sounds better, it sounds fancier, uh, highfalutin, one might say, um, is that good or bad? Well, as a linguist, the answer is it is language and language is language. There is no good or bad. Um, but at the time, this was sort of a serious matter and people got into some real arguments about it. One of the arguments, uh, this one is from somebody whose name I didn't record. I am of this opinion that our own tongue should be written clean and pure, unmixed and unmangled and borrowing other with borrowings of other tongues, wherein we might not heed by time, ever borrowing and never paying. She shall be fain to keep her house as bankrupt. Um, so here's somebody arguing against the borrowings. There was quite a lot of arguments for the borrowings. There were other examples where we just had a semantic gap. So we didn't have a word for something in English. So we'd either create our own word, a neologism, or we would borrow another word and not necessarily use it correctly, but we'd, we'd stick it in there. Um, another, an example of this uh, is moose. So we're gonna talk really quickly about moose because it's something I feel strongly about. The plural of moose is moose. Why is the plural of moose moose? Plural, mm, the plural of moose is moose because moose is not a indigenously English word. It is an Algonquin word, uh, probably Abenaki. Um, and it, it may or may not have meant bar, uh, like barch, uh, bark stripper, uh, which makes a lot of sense when you think about how moose eat. Uh, so why is moose not inflected like goose, which sounds and is spelled basically just like it, goose geese. Moose is not inflected that way because it's not an English word. It is an Algonquin word. And we tried out some other uh, inflections. We tried mooses. There's, I think, a Thomas Jefferson letter that uses mooses. And we tried moosac for a while, which is one of the Algonquin languages uh, uh, plurals, but we didn't like Musak either. Uh, Abenaki, if I remember correctly, Abenaki uses moose moose in both the singular and plural. And we were good with it. And why didn't we call a moose an elk? English had a word, um, but when we got to the Americas, we had at that point in England killed off all the moose. And so we get to the Americas, we know that elk means large deer-like object, and we are introduced to what the locals are calling a wapiti, and it looks like a large deer-like object. So that's an elk. Then we go north and we see the moose emerging out of the swamp, like the swamp thing, and we're like, the fuck is that? with the antlers, with the moss, with the big chin thing going on, with like 15 different joints on its legs. What, what is that please? And the people locally were like, well, it's a moose. And so the English were like, okay, cool, cool, moose, you got it. Um, and so moose, and it was filling the semantic gap and it uh, is inflected unlike goose, because it's not an indigenous English word. Soapbox is now put away. Uh, the first example, uh, oh, semantic narrowing. So we do have a number of words that actually lose their meaning. So suffer is something that we, is a good example. In the Bible, you'll see suffer the little children to come to me or suffer not a witch to live. Suffer historically meant to allow, allow the little children to come to me. Um, allow not a witch to live. Uh, but obviously it's today, it's suffer has lost that meaning. Uh, and then 1672, uh, John Dryden writes defense of the epilogue and kicks off the tradition of people complaining about other people's use of the English language. So basically, don't be like John Dryden. And then here's some online resources. Uh, original pronunciations, that website I told you about with the uh, information on how to pronounce early modern English. Um, Ellie Van Gelderen produced an online textbook, History of the English Language. It's actually, it actually goes from early uh, from Old English all the way through. Um, it's a fantastic resource. I found her chapter on early modern English particularly useful in preparing this presentation. Um, it's all online. It's all free. I encourage you to check it out. She also has a number of other resources. Uh, public, uh, sorry, the Oxford English Dictionary. Oxford, who doesn't love the Oxford English Dictionary? If you haven't read the book, The Professor and the Madman, I completely encourage you to. Uh, 
I found their overview of early modern English to be to be very useful and would recommend it to anybody who wants sort of a quick introduction to the idea, uh, but more thorough than the one I've just given you. So that's that's it for historical English. Let's talk really quickly about the future. If I can click on a button correctly. So languages are in a constant state of flux. Uh, we don't know what future languages are going to sound like because we don't know what changes or what uh, is going to impact English or whatever languages we're speaking. We don't know what's going to come along one day and change how we how we use our words. Um, we also try not to make values judgments about language. So linguists, there is no good language and bad language. We leave that to the English department and they're better funding. Um, so we try very hard not to say like, oh, that's a very bad use of language. It's just a non-standard use of language. You have standard and non-standard, and neither is better than the other. Uh, can versus may, or uh, any of these little kind of things that your English teacher might have told you was an error. You know what? If I say, can I go to the bathroom? Do you understand what I mean when I say, can I go to the bathroom? I mean, I would like to go use the restroom. Do you mind if I leave? Uh, don't be that person who's like, I don't know, can you? Um, do you if you understood each other, if you understood what I meant, Congratulations, we both successfully used language. Uh, however, if you're working with somebody who's uh, first language or who's an, a learner of the language that you are fluent in, um, be considerate and try and stick to those standard forms because it makes it a little easier for them to understand. Uh, as you as they improve their language use, you can kind of mix up what you're doing. But you know, everybody deserves sort of a to be nice to each other. Uh, books I recommend. Um, I talked a little bit about Peter Baker's Introduction to Old English. Um, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien was co-author of the Middle English Reader. I bought it because it has his name on it and it just really deeply amused me, but it is actually a pretty decent reader and, uh, and uh, vocabulary. Uh, language Files is, if you want a bunch of very concise information about linguistics, about a broad range of linguistic topics, I completely recommend uh, Language Files. It's from Ohio State University's Linguistics Department. I think it's in like its 12th edition now, but 8th edition is the one that I had on hand. Um, it's outstanding. Uh, and then uh, Elaine Traharn's Old and Middle English an Anthology is, she's got a, it starts in the beginning with Old English and you've got side-by-side -side translations, it moves through Middle English, and as Middle English becomes sort of more comprehensible, um, it becomes, uh, the, those side-by-sides go away. So that's where both of my readings came from today. Um, please don't blame her for my lack of uh, skill, lack of finesse. And then if this was the live presentation, now would be the time to ask questions. Unfortunately, this is a recorded presentation. So um, please, if you have questions, I didn't give you my contact information, but I will put my contact information in the description below and feel free to send me an email or Facebook uh, comment. Thank you guys very, very much for listening to this. I hope you've enjoyed the last about hour and 20 minutes and uh, language is the best. <laughs>